Hey everyone, welcome back to a hardware news recap for the past week of news in the industry. We have information on Coffee Lake, Vega 11, uh, Colorful's crazy motherboard that they have for mining, and a couple of new keyboard switches along with information on Paul from Paul's Hardware. Before that, this is brought to you by the EVGA 240 CLC, which is a $120 MSRP closed loop liquid cooler. The EVGA 240 CLC has an RGB illuminated pump plate, uses a thermal probe within the lower pump chamber for liquid temperature monitoring, and allows customization through software. Learn more at the link in the description below. The first news item for the week is that Paul from Paul's Hardware has been lying to you all. He's secretly a GPU miner. It hurts me just as much to say it as it hurts you to hear it, but Gamers Nexus recently came to find out that, yes, Paul from Paul's Hardware does have very serious GPU mining problems. And Paul, after you attempted to call me out for using the word gouge in your recent podcast, I really had no recourse but to bring up this serious problem of yours with GPU mining. And, you know, the thing is, Paul and Kyle, with that live stream, opened up with some questionable content that probably violates Twitch terms of service. And following that, and obviously a bout of embarrassment, they decided to change the topic to talk about my use of the phrase price gouging, which apparently has a specific definition in 13 US states. So as Paul points out, the phrase price gouging in these states is only usable for things like food and gas, topics which Paul is no doubt very familiar with. Well, years ago, Paul uploaded a video entitled Reclamation Garage Worklog 4. Paul, I'm here to call you out. Reclamation has a very specific legal definition here in the U.S. Quoting uslegal.com, the Congress of the United States enacted Public Law 95-87. Of course, you know of this one, I'm sure. The law was known as the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act of 1977, known heretofore as Reclamation Law. Reclamation Law often involves financing of abandoned mining sites and establishing an abandoned mine land reclamation fund to finance said restoration of said land. Think about it. All of his garage work logs may seem like an innocent way to make content on a morning's notice, but in reality, Paul is building the ultimate GPU mining facility in his garage and he's using government funds to finance that project, hence the reclamation of the garage. So Paul, I'm sorry it had to be this way, the people had to know your use of the legal phrase reclamation doesn't fool anyone here. Gotcha. All right, so I rest my case on that. Uh, if you want to see their episode, go to Paul's Hardware or Bitwit, and they've got their full live stream over there. Two episodes, one on each channel. It's worth watching. Uh, just, uh, you know, make sure Paul knows about the reclamation thing. So first real news item. Not that Paul isn't a real news item. Vega 11. According to Digitimes and Tech Power Up, it sounds like AMD is looking to shift its packaging responsibilities off of ASE and onto another facility. So this other one is called Siliconware Precision Industries, or SPIL. And SPIL has already begun packaging Vega 10 GPUs, and they have reportedly through Digitimes and other reports that uh, Tech Power Up sites reportedly have been tasked with Vega 11 GPUs going forward. And this is, well, let's give, let's give an idea why this happened first, I suppose. So ASE was partly responsible for AMD's limited launch quantities with Vega 10 GPUs, which were the 64 and 56 cards that came out. Vega 10 is the actual GPU that's on there. And uh, because of units getting stuck in packaging and assembly, not packaging like this, but packaging like getting the HBM, the interposer, and the die all onto a single package with yield, actually being usable afterward. That process apparently uh, wasn't going over so well with ASE. So it sounds like AMD is splitting or moving these, these responsibilities in part to SPIL for Vega 11 and potentially Vega 10 as well. As for Vega 11 and the specs, we're not yet sure if that'll run GDDR5 or HBM2. Vega 11 will definitely be a new GPU from Vega 10, so that much is certain. And it's possible that AMD could have a built-in GDDR5 controller with Vega 11, the lower end GPUs where they stick with HBM2 on Vega 10. That's possible, but we just don't know yet. The HBM 
uh, setup on there, HPCC, the protocol has the capability, as does the rest of the GPU, to use either GDDR5 or HBM2, but the controller on Vega 10 only is for HBM2. They don't have a GDDR5 controller on the Vega 64, 56, and Frontier Edition cards. So it's only possible for them, for AMD, to use HBM2 on those cards. If they go with a GDDR5 controller on Vega 11, then maybe something will change there, but we just don't know right now. So uh, either way, Vega 11 has the opportunity to pick between them, depending on if AMD designed a GDDR5 memory controller for 11, what the power parameters might be, things like that. We'll talk about that more when the time comes, but for now, Vega 11 is slated to replace Polaris. So the 500 and 400 lines, which have seen shortages throughout most of the year, should be replaced by Vega 11 at some point in the semi-near future. For the next news item, Coffee Lake's 1151 socket's been making rounds. ASRock's recent Z370 motherboard and other document leaks have shown that the new Coffee Lake motherboards will use socket LGA1151, just like the existing Z270 motherboards. It's a little bit upsetting that the Coffee Lake CPUs won't be backwards compatible with LGA 1151 boards from Z270's line. From what we know now, it looks like Z370 and Z270 won't have significant chipset differences and they're gonna have the same socket, very pretty much the same architecture. But that's not to say Coffee Lake is unexciting as a CPU. Going to six cores is pretty interesting. But uh, does it need to exist on a new motherboard if it's got the same socket, very similar if not the same chipset, and same TDP, same pretty much everything? What What's the impetus there for having a new motherboard requirement? That's what I'm interested in. So that's pretty frustrating, but also something that Intel's done in the past. This is not new for Intel to force a motherboard change with a CPU release. Uh, in recent years, they've done a little bit better with having intercompatible boards and CPUs. Hopefully, there's some unofficial support of that here, but to move away from it in an official stance uh, is definitely disappointing. So, a little disappointed in Intel for that. But as Tom's Hardware points out, the leaked ASRock page did differ a bit from previous leaks that have been around for Coffee Lake specifications, but not in significant ways in terms of the specs everyone's been talking about. So the leaks, the differences in the leaks from what Tom's Hardware noted on the ASRock page were that the core counts line up as the i5 still being six core, six threads. That's the same. i7 is still six core, 12 thread. i3 is still four core, four thread. But the i3-8350K's TDP is listed as 91 watts on ASRock's page where previously it was in the 60 watt range. And then the cache is also listed as nine megabytes for the 8600K and eight megabytes for the 8350K, which is a bit higher than the previous leaks or rumors as well, but not too much. So that's the only real change there. Colorful's latest motherboard is a, quote, professional mining motherboard, which eliminates reliance on riser cards by instead creating a board that's nearly two feet long. At 485 by 195 millimeters, the board hosts seven PCIe X1 slots and one PCIe X16 slot, using an additional 16 PCIe power cables along the board alongside one EPS four pin. This bypasses a 24 pin connector, which could potentially cause issues in some configurations or with some power supplies, depending on how they're doing signaling. The motherboard also takes liberties with memory here. So Colorful is using a SODIM module rather than a full length DIM. And IO is limited to two USB 2.0, one HDMI and one RJ45 and there's also a single SATA 3 port present. So aside from looking kind of comical, not really sure how useful that is even to the serious miners. A lot of the pictures I've seen generally look like they've just got a bunch of riser cards hanging off of boards, and then you have people like either Asus or ASRock recently with that board that had in the teens of very short PCIe connectors on their motherboard with just a bunch of risers sticking out of them. So. Does this fill a different market? I don't know, but uh, it's another interesting, colorful creation. So at the very least, they're getting media coverage of it in the West. We've seen a lot of that in the past week. Uh, next news item here, Jonesbow and their TW closed loop liquid coolers. So Jonesbow, for those who don't know, uh, Jonesbow is a supplier in the case industry and a design company. They supplied the Rosewell Cullinan 
case and the uh, Anadis AI Crystal. That's the same case. It's made by Jonesboe ultimately, and they provide a lot of the other cases in the market as well. They've provided several of the mini ITX cases in the past, specifically to Rosewell, like their Legacy W1 series. That was a Jonesboe design and recently woke up and stuck tempered glass on everything. So you're seeing a lot more of them now, even if they're just rebrands ultimately. So this company is now getting into closed loop liquid coolers and they're doing that with a TW series, starting with TW120 and 240 CLCs. And the focus is largely on design here. So uh, Jones was using a hexagon shaped pump block with hexagon stamps in the fan housing. So it's stamped out with hexagons everywhere and RGB LEDs everywhere, or at least LEDs everywhere. Uh, apparently supports synchronization with ASUS and MSI motherboard software. And uh, the ID matches between the fan and the pump. So kind of different, definitely got more of an industrial look to it or something, but uh, that's new from Jonesbow this week. The next news item is Kale's new Mini Chalk PG1232 switches, which minimize switch height for mechanical keyboards. These PG1232 switches use a smaller form factor than what we're used to with the Cherry MX clones or the Cherry MX switches. The pre-travel is about 1.2 millimeters, plus or minus 0.5 millimeters, apparently, and actuation is 2.4 millimeters. This should feel similar to the MX Blues in terms of actuation force required. It's clicky only for now, and the company is looking into alternatives if there's interest. But uh, other than that, it's basically a smaller version of what already exists in case you wanted a, a, an ultra small uh, form factor mechanical switch. And then finally, this is some website news. So we finally switched over to SSL. So the website should be fully HTTPS now rather than HTTP. If you want to check it out, you can go to gamersnexus.net. I don't think anything's broken specifically because of the switch to SSL. There are things that are broken, but I don't think that's why. Uh, if you see any page loading errors or other redirect issues that pertain specifically to SSL, tweet at us at gamersnexus, let me know, and we'll get those resolved. But lots of stuff going on for the website. The first one was moving to SSL, and then we've got some other updates backend performance-wise, things like that and eventually some front-end changes. So uh, that's all for this time at patreon.com slash gamersnexus. If you'd like to help us out directly, subscribe for more. I'll leave a quick note here for the next 10 days or so. I'm going to be producing a lot of the videos uh, on my own. Andrew is heading out for a little bit. So we're going to be shooting in this setup because it's already all set up like this. And uh, I apologize if the editing is not quite up to what you're used to, but I'll do my best. So uh, thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time. We have information on a few things, Coffee Lake, Vega Lake, 